Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York webinar, an introduction to Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. Today's webinar will focus on the prevention and management of pests, primarily through non-chemical means. We'll also touch a bit on pest identification strategies and resources. And um, we've got a really good group today. Please feel free to use the chat box on the side to send questions you might have as we go along. With the system, we don't have online participatory chat, um, so you won't necessarily see the questions you post, but we will be receiving them here, and I'll probably be responding to some as I go along and holding others for the end. Jason Hen, who's the Dipsney Communications Assistant, will be helping me with fielding questions and any technical difficulties that might occur. Just so you're aware, the presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website sometime next week. Um, to get started, my name is Jillian Marcus and I am the Preservation Specialist for DIPSNY. I'm trained as a paper conservator and I've spent time working both at the conservation bench um, as well as on the preservation side of collections. Okay. Oops. Because DIPSNY is relatively new, I'd like to take a moment to share a bit of information about our program. The Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program, or DIPSNY as we call it for short, is a five-year initiative to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs and workshops. Hey, sorry, we're just having a little bit of tech. And um, welcome to today's Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York webinar, an introduction to integrated pest management. Apologies, I am on the wrong slide here. There we go. Um, today's webinar will focus on the prevention and management of pests, primarily through non-chemical means. We'll also touch a bit on pest identification strategies and resources. We've got a really good group today. Um, please feel free to use the chat box on the side to send questions you might have as we go along. With this system, we don't have online participatory chat, so you won't necessarily see the questions you post. We will be receiving them here, and I'll probably be responding to some as I go along and holding others for the end. Jason Hen, who's the Dipsney Communications Assistant, will be helping me with fielding questions and any technical difficulties that might occur. Hopefully no more technical difficulties. Um, just so you're aware, the presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website sometime next week. To get started, my name is Jillian and I'm the Preservation Specialist for DIPSNY. Um, I'm trained as a paper conservator and I've spent time working both at the conservation bench as well as on the preservation side of collections. Because DIPSNY is relatively new, I'd like to take a moment to share a bit of information about our program. The Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program, or DIPSNY as we call it for short, is a five-year initiative to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs and workshops. DIPSNY makes these services available free of charge to New York-based organizations that collect, preserve, and make accessible historical records and or library research materials. You can learn more about DIPSNY and our services at our website, which is dhpsny.org. DIPSNY is a collaboration between two long-running New York programs, the New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library Conservation and Preservation Program. It was established in 2016 by the New York State Education Department's Office of Cultural Education to ensure delivery of consistent and comprehensive services to the vast network of organizations that safeguard New York's records and make them accessible. That's you guys. So thank you for attending. Um, now let's talk about pests. Um, I'm going to assume that some of you listening to this webinar have been through a pest infestation in your collection. Um, 
And if you have a story to share about dealing with some sort of pest infestation, please feel free to. Um, you won't be able to see each other's comments. Actually, we're, we're working on that. You may be able to see each other's comments. Um, but I will be able to see yours, and I'll share some of them. So if you feel like sharing your experience, you can go ahead and type that in the chat box there. It's always good to, to see what everyone has, um, how people have handled a difficult situation. In the past, um, pest control and collections often meant using pesticides, and although we know how harmful pesticides are now, until the mid to late 20th century, most people weren't necessarily aware that what they were doing was harmful to humans and the environment. The great thing about integrated pest management is that it is a more holistic approach to keeping pests out of collections. It's also often a more economical approach to getting rid of pests because you're working to prevent the problem before it starts. IPM works through the management of pests by monitoring activity, controlling the climate, eliminating food and water sources, blocking building entry points, and establishing good housekeeping practices. There are many reasons to use IPM in libraries and archives. Primarily using non-pesticide measures means less potential harm to human beings and the environment. It's also often more cost-effective and sustainable than pesticides, and it's safer for the objects you're trying to protect. IPM can be broken down into a four-pronged approach, avoiding and blocking pests from establishing a home in your collection, detecting an infestation and assessing the extent of the situation, identifying exactly what the pests in your collection are and where they are, and responding in a way which is sensitive to the needs of the collection, staff, and the environment. Um, I'm going to actually start with identification because figuring out what pests are in your collection can often seem overwhelming. Insects sometimes look the same to the unaided eye, which can make identifying them tricky. We'll begin at, by looking at how you can identify the various insects and some vertebrates as well. Um, they can be pests too, which might be in your collection because knowing what signs to look for can help you to nip a growing problem in the bud as quickly as possible. You can create an inexpensive kit for identifying pests, assembling materials that can be found almost anywhere. You'll want to gather the following, um, USB microscope, magnifying glass or loop, a pest atlas, an online resource or pest identification book with photographs, sticky traps or insect food pheromones, a light source, for example, an LED flashlight, tweezers, a small Ziploc baggie or small Ziploc baggies, um, or plastic or glass vials with lids, small brush, pencil, a pest logbook, which we'll be talking um, a bit about later, and a camera. So we'll start with vertebrates. Um, they can vary by region. Common vertebrate pests include rats, mice, and squirrels, birds, and occasionally larger vertebrates such as rabbits, feral cats, bats, uh, raccoons, possums, and snakes. You're less likely to see larger vertebrates in your collection, but they are more common than you might think, especially in historic buildings. Signs of pest activity include droppings, tooth marks, um, or areas where you can see something has been eaten away, nests made from shredded paper and cloth, paw prints, or noises and unusual odors. Mice or rats in the walls can often sound much bigger than they are. Um, I've lived in a house with mice, and they sound so loud in the walls that we thought we had a giant creature. So it may be mice if you hear large uh, scuffling and hopefully not something larger. Um, birds will often leave nests, feathers, um, and unfortunately urine and excrement as well. Signs of pest activity for insects are less obvious, although much more common. For the purpose of identifying insect pest activity, we'll divide them into three general categories of destruction borers, shredders, and grazers. I encourage you to use um, one of the online pest atlases to visually identify pests and the damage they leave behind. There are so many insects out there and often they look very similar to the unaided eye. There's um, a wealth of information online which is constantly being updated, however, and I'll have, um, I'll have some links to places you can go to identify your pests later on in the webinar. Borers typically damage hardwoods and softwoods, animal glued plywood, furniture, wicker, 
wood pulp paper, and books. They leave behind exit holes, tunnels, and frass, um, which is basically the excrement and garbage left behind by uh, the insect larva. If you see these holes and brush the inside gently, the powdery frass will come out, which is a sure sign that an insect has been breeding. Borers include the common furniture beetle, the woodworm, um, which is actually the larval stage of the furniture beetle, and the powder post beetle. The powder post beetle prefers hardwoods such as oak, ash, and hickory. They can be found in the envelope of your building as well as in wood objects such as furniture. Common furniture beetles and their larvae, um, which are the woodworms, enjoy damp wood environments and areas with high relative humidity. And as an aside, most of these insects are tiny, really only a few millimeters long. And this is where it comes in handy to have some type of magnification device to be able to differentiate various species from one another. Shredders consume keratin, which is the protein in hair, wool, parchment, feathers, skin, horn, nail, and hooves. Um, they're the enemies of many textile and natural history collections, and they leave behind a mess of cast off skins, silken tubes, and frass. Shredders include the webbing clothes moth, case-bearing clothes moth, and the white-shouldered house moth. If you've ever noticed holes in your favorite sweater, you most likely have a webbing clothes moth um, building a home. Sometimes these moths are confused with the grain-eating moths that you find in cupboards, um, cupboards of food in your house, but clothes moths have tiny hairs on their head. If you catch a clothes moth and look at it under a magnifying glass, you should see that they actually have um, furry heads. The larval stage is the most dangerous for collections as the baby moths feed on protein as they grow. By the time you see them fluttering around, they have probably done some damage and are ready to breed um, or have started breeding. White-shouldered house moths are actually omnivorous, so they are attracted to grain sources as well as protein and wool, fur, etc. They're easy to identify by the white patches where their shoulders would be um, if they had shoulders. Many species of beetle also fall into the shredder category. Varied carpet beetles, which look a bit like a decorative carpet themselves, prefer natural history specimens, rugs, textiles, fur, insect specimens, and furniture. Their larvae are fuzzy and look like tiny caterpillars. Um, the caterpillar looking thing in the first slide actually um, is the larva of a varied carpet beetle. The black carpet beetle enjoys both animal protein and plant-based materials. The vodka beetle prefers protein-based materials such as wool, skin, and hair. Um, they're actually also attracted to dry herbarium specimens and other plant matter um, if there isn't protein-based material to eat. Um, the drugstore beetle is also known as the bread or biscuit beetle, and it can be found in dried vegetative material, as well as furniture, natural history collections, fur, leather, and books. Moving on to grazers, um, these pests primarily feed on starch and protein and thrive in damp conditions. Actually, a great deal of um, pests of different kinds thrive in high humidity, so keeping the relative humidity in your collection controlled is really crucial for a, in, um, avoiding an infestation. Grazers damage objects by scratching and eroding them, um, as you can see in this image here, in which silverfish have uh, pretty badly damaged a book. Grazers include common household insects, such as silverfish and cockroaches, as well as book lice and cigarette beetles. Cigarette beetles infest books, herbarium specimens, leather, silk, and natural history objects. They tend to become very active in subdued light and fly around and then play dead when the lights are on, so don't be fooled. Book lice um, are not actually lice, but have a similar appearance. They feed on fungi and mold, so if you see book lice present, that could actually indicate that you have a mold problem as well. Um, at the very least, it indicates that the relative humidity in your collection is probably too high and is maybe high enough um, for potential mold growth. Book lice are drawn to the starchy adhesives in wallpaper or books, and lowering the relative humidity in affected areas to 50% will prevent their development by eliminating potential moldy food sources. Silverfish, as you saw earlier, are attracted to starchy adhesives as well as proteins. This means that they will eat book bindings, carpet, textiles, glue, hair, paper, photographic materials, cotton, silk, and linen. 
The most common insect pests in libraries and archives in New York State um, include bed bugs, book lice, cigarette beetles, carpet beetles, cockroaches, termites, case bearing clothes moths, silverfish, and fire brats. Um, there are, of course, many others, but these are some of the most reliable offenders in the state. I want to touch briefly on bed bugs right now since bed bug problems seem to have. Um, resurfaced in the last few years. Uh, bed bugs are usually carried in with unsuspecting patrons and visitors and can find a home in soft furnishings such as upholstered chairs and carpets. They can also hitch a ride in on circulating materials such as books. Unlike the other pests we've talked about today, bed bugs don't actually eat collections materials but they do bite humans so they would be um, eating your staff and patrons. It's a good idea to check circulating material which has been returned, especially in the book gutters and along the edges. I can't really emphasize this enough. Um, you might look at a book from the outside and it looks just fine, but those gutters can really hide um, a number of things. If an incoming book has bed bugs, it should be placed in a Ziploc bag and placed in a warm, sunny spot for two weeks. Um, alternatively, there are small thermal devices such as thermal strike or pack tight, um, which are fairly inexpensive and can heat objects to the correct temperature for eradicating bed bugs. For rare or very fragile books or objects, freezing is probably the safest option. If you're unsure of what to do, you can always call Dipsy staff and we will be happy to talk you through um, what your options are for specific types of pests um, and specific types of materials. I think something which is occasionally overlooked when discussing insect pests is the reminder that not all insects which can be found in collections are necessarily pests. Um, I was actually watching a webinar on pest management recently and the instructor said that if you find absolutely no insects at all in your institution, um, it probably means that the environment is toxic and you don't want to be there. That makes sense to me. Um, one insect is particularly helpful for pest control and that's the pseudoscorpion or book scorpion. They're so small that you've probably overlooked them in your collection, but they're actually um, team players when it comes to pest management. That's because they eat some of the insects which you don't want in your collection, such as book lice and clothes moths, um, while leaving the books alone. Think of them as unpaid interns who are very, very quiet. <laughs> Non-pest insects um, are actually very important in that they can indicate another problem in your institution, such as building or environmental issues. Um, you can also see where pests might be coming from and they might indicate a crack in the wall, a place where the window isn't sealed, things like that. Monitoring will help you to begin evaluating whether or not the insects in your collection are in fact pests. Um, much in the way you would prepare for potential security risks or natural disasters, it helps to evaluate your institution for potential pest risks. This means doing a thorough inspection, conducting a monitoring program, and getting to know the creatures that inhabit your library or archive. The first series of questions you want to be able to answer before there's a problem. Which parts of your collection are most at risk? Is it the herbarium specimens or the collection of rare books or both? which part of the building or buildings are most at risk? Are there activities which your institution carries out regularly, such as serving food and drink during events or eating near collections materials, um, which might present a good opportunity for a pest infestation? And are there signs of insects or other pests that you or your colleagues have noticed in the past? If you do believe that you have a pest infestation, then the next step is to evaluate how serious the situation is. Where have pests been noted in your collection? What stage in the life cycle are they? If you found larvae, that indicates that they are breeding, for example. Is there any visible damage? Are you finding carcasses or are the insects still alive? How many are they and of what species? And the really you know, scary question for pest management, how many objects appear to be affected? And we've touched on the materials that attract pests. They tend to be drawn to proteinaceous materials such as hair or leather and vegetable matter or starch. Unfortunately, that just about covers everything in an institution's collections. They particularly like these objects if they are dirty or damp because that provides extra food and hydration. Um, so materials at risk for insect attack include fur, dried herbarium specimens, feathers, animal skin, hair, damp organic material, parchment and vellum, starch-based adhesives, silk, dried food, hair, insect and natural history specimens, paper, um, 
especially paper which is dirty or damp, and wood. Hopefully you've assessed the situation and you don't have an infestation on your hands, um, but you want to avoid the occurrence of one. Removing the things which attract pests is your first line of defense. Pests are drawn to collections for four big reasons. They're drawn to the food sources, warmth, high humidity and dampness, and the many hiding spots they can make a home in your collection. That includes flowers and plants, gaps in the floor, ventilation ducts, and in dark places. Um, if you don't offer these amenities to pests, they will look elsewhere, hopefully far away from your institution. So some things that attract pests are paper, wood, leather, human food, um, things that we've just gone over, 68 degrees Fahrenheit and above, high humidity and dampness, and good hiding spots such as ventilation ducts, cracks between floorboards, unused rooms, flowers and plants, um, dead space underneath exhibition furniture and storage cabinets, gaps between walls and floors, and chimneys. Regular routine housekeeping is probably one of the most important things you can do to avoid a pest infestation. It removes food sources for the pests, um, and regular cleaning also allows you to monitor some of the dark or hidden areas in your collection for nests. Having time to regularly and thoroughly inspect your collection for early signs of an infestation is crucial to stopping a problem in its tracks. Sealing gaps in the building envelope and repairing holes and cracks will block pests from coming in. And these sound like really simple measures, but they are incredibly effective. Segregating potentially infested objects from other collections materials as they come in is also crucial. This can be done using a procedure known as isolation, um, which we'll cover in a bit. Being vigilant about things that enter the collection can save you from a lot of difficulty later on. I've worked with so many collections who didn't have issues until an infested book was brought into the building, um, and that ends up resulting, as you can imagine, in a costly, frustrating, and time-consuming situation, which you know, could have been avoided just a little bit of observation. Uh, monitoring, um, we're going to move on to monitoring pests now. Monitoring insect populations with traps is simple and effective for pinpointing exactly what um, and where a pest infestation occurs. Sticky traps or blender traps, as they are also known, are probably the most common type of sticky trap used to monitor insects. These traps are designed to trap crawling insects in particular. They're small enough to be placed in dark corners and underneath furniture, and you've probably seen them in most institutions if you don't have them um, already in your own. Pheromone traps can be used for flying insects such as moths or crawling insects such as roaches. It's important to know what pests you're trying to trap as pheromones differ for different pests. Male insects are drawn by the hormones given off by female insects to attract a mate. Um, which are pheromones, which are held in small vials within the traps. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once they enter the traps, the insects can't get out, which cuts down on insect breeding and helps to track their movements. Traps should be placed in a regular pattern around the building with their positions marked on a map of the building um, or area of the building you're trying to track. Traps should then be inspected regularly with the number and type of insect recorded. This will help you to, to determine whether the insects you're catching are actually pests and also um, it will help to determine their life cycle too. If you notice larvae in the, tramp for, in the trap, excuse me, for example, that indicates that the insects are um, breeding. For non-insect pests, the same procedure applies, although you may want to check them more frequently because if left too long, it's possible that an animal carcass may actually attract additional pests. Um, and I have an example here of Utah State University's uh, library's pest log, um, which is pretty basic. I've also um, uploaded a very simple template of a pest log that you can make copies of um, and use for different areas. Traps don't necessarily have to kill pests, um, particularly when we're talking about mice. For example, humane traps um, are available for mice. You must check and empty them regularly though, and if you're going to empty them, take them to a place far from your institution or they will come right back in. Um, the greenhouse with mice in it is a humane trap called a smart mouse trap, and they are available online and at uh, quite a few hardware stores. Um, in conclusion, traps are necessary to identify and track pests and non-pests, pinpoint an increase in insect population in a specific area, monitor the spread of pests from one area to another, 
track an invasion of adult insects um, in the summer, pinpoint a localized infestation in problem areas, and determine the success or failure of a control treatment you may have recently implemented. And actually that's one of the most important reasons um, to have traps. Even, you know, once you've gotten an IPM program underway, it helps you to track how what you're actually doing um, is progressing. Once you've tracked your pests and identify where the problem is, the next step is to consider the best options to treat your collection. There are a multitude of infestation response options, um, but we'll touch briefly on four options which are used by institutions to fight um, infestations in their collections. This includes isolation, low temperature treatment or freezing, heat treatment, modified atmosphere treatment, including anoxic carbon dioxide and nitrogen and argon gas treatment. We'll also talk briefly about two options which were common in the past but are not recommended now. It's helpful to know about all of the options so that you can make an informed choice, particularly when liaising with professional pest control companies who may not necessarily be familiar with the best treatments for um, archival and library objects in particular. Just a reminder, um, too, that no matter what treatment you choose, you must always document it in detail. In an isolation treatment, an object suspected of infestation is placed on a white backdrop, uh, for example, blotter um, or another white object-safe material, and sealed in a polyethylene bag. The sealed package is then monitored for weeks or months. This is especially good for objects which can't, for whatever reason, be frozen or treated right away. And we'll go over some of the reasons um, in a bit why um, archival material may, you may not want to freeze that. Um, isolation is good in that um, it quarantines an object suspected of infestation so that nearby objects are not infested. It allows the objects to be monitored for weeks or months so that pests can be identified and the life cycle stage determined. It can be used for a variety of types of objects and it's appropriate for complex objects and objects um, entering or re-entering an institution. It is time consuming, however, and only appropriate for a small number of objects and you have to devote time to monitoring it um, pretty carefully. Sorry, I just uh, skipped over a slide there. Low temperature treatment, better known as freezing, is another common treatment. Objects suspected of infestation or with confirmed pest infestation are placed in a polyethylene bag and then frozen at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 20, 72 hours. Sometimes two cycles will be necessary, particularly with wood boring insects, an object should be allowed to return to room temperature slowly, remaining wrapped for 24 hours outside of the freezer. Um, and this helps them sort of reacclimate. Low temperature tre uh, treatment is short. It's a pretty quick treatment um, in the scheme of things, um, but it should not be used on oil or acrylic paintings on canvas objects with layers of media, photographic materials, case photographs, and glass archival materials. It can also increase the fragility of delicate objects, especially when they are returning to room temperature. Heat treatment exposes objects to heat in order to kill insects. Short exposures of 130 degrees Fahrenheit are sufficient to eradicate many pests, and this treatment can be scaled um, from using a chamber for a few objects to a large on object on site or even an entire building. Heat treatment exposes objects to high temperatures in order to kill insects. There are various versions of this treatment actually um, and two proprietary names that you'll probably see a lot are thermolignum and solar bagging. Solar bagging uses the sun to reach the high temperatures needed to eradicate pests. Heat treatment is very effective. It can be applied to both small and large scale infestations from one object to an entire building. And um, I've actually seen uh, heat trucks which can come out. So if you have a very large object, um, we're talking maybe um, a piece of furniture or even a carriage that can be treated on the site in one of these heat trucks. Um, and they can also actually treat an entire building, make a giant sort of hot box. Um, it's not recommended for items which are sensitive to changes in relative humidity for obvious reasons. Um, it's also not recommended for low melting point waxes, 
some adhesives, flammable and explosive objects, and some plastics which melt or deform when exposed to heat. Next, I'll talk a bit about modified atmosphere treatments, which includes anoxia, controlled atmosphere treatment or CAT treatment with carbon dioxide, and nitrogen argon gas treatment. Um, and there's a picture there of a uh, building, a um, anoxic chamber. An anoxic treatment often uses oxygen scavenger packets, which pull the oxygen from the air. The infested object or objects are placed in a sealed enclosure with the packets and the air is removed, um, which is what you saw in the previous image. Oxygen levels are then reduced to less than 0.5% for three weeks, which results in an atmosphere which is almost entirely composed of nitrogen. Treatment length will vary, but approximately 21 days is considered sufficient to kill almost all insects at all stages of life. Anoxic treatment is inexpensive. It works for a variety of materials and it's very effective. Um, it is time consuming though. You have that 21 day um, incubation period. It can be difficult to maintain relative humidity equilibrium. It must be monitored carefully and it's unable to be used on objects with Prussian blue dyes or pigments. Um, and usually if you're going to carry this treatment out, I think most museum um, anoxia vendors are aware of, of which pigments um, should not be included in this treatment. Control atmosphere treatment or CAT is often inaccurately referred to as an anoxic treatment, um, but it isn't. It's, it uses carbon dioxide to displace oxygen in a sealed enclosure to low levels, excuse me, to levels low enough <clears throat> to kill insects at all stages of life. After about three to four weeks, the carbon dioxide is removed and the treatment is completed. So in a sealed container, um, carbon dioxide is essentially used to displace oxygen to levels low enough to kill insects. Air is evacuated and the enclosure is actually filled with CO2. And this is repeated until the atmosphere inside the enclosure is roughly 60%. Cat, um, cat treatment is safe for most objects. It can be set up in-house. It's very effective at killing insects from all stages of life, and there aren't any residual effects um, afterward. It's also time-consuming, um, expensive, requires special equipment, knowledge, and possibly permits or licenses depending upon um, where you live, and it must be monitored very carefully. Nitrogen argon gas treatment works similarly to other modified atmosphere treatments using nitrogen and argon gas to push oxygen levels down to levels which are inhospitable for insects. Insects death usually occurs um, between two to six weeks. It can be a little more time efficient than um, carbon dioxide treatment. It's appropriate for a wide variety of objects. An argon can actually also prevent biodeterioration from fungi and bacteria. It's also expensive, as you can imagine, um, and nitrogen can contribute to growth of certain microorganisms. Fumigation was a pretty standard treatment in collections for a very long time, and unfortunately some objects in museum, library, and archival collections still um, have residue from this procedure. It isn't recommended except in cases where it's a last resort. If fumigation is chosen, you'll want to remove the object from your collection and actually send it away to a facility as you really do not want to um, fumigate the entire collection. <clears throat> Chemicals which were considered safe in the past have left dangerous residues in some objects, including arsenic and mercury. Um, I've seen collections where they had several books which had been painted with mercury. Um, most likely sometime in the 19th century, and the residue from this treatment was actually still visible. So it really should be um, a last resort only. And in the past, um, fumigants such as ethylene oxide and methyl bromide were used. These are very, very rarely used now. 
One final note about pesticides. We've talked a lot about how to avoid them, but it's worth reiterating that you never want to treat collections materials directly with pesticides. This can change both the physical structure and the chemical makeup of an object, um, aside from leaving a possibly toxic residue. It's actually illegal in New York State for anyone who isn't a certified commercial applicator to use large quantities of pesticides. So any use of pesticides um, in a building would need to be done through a licensed and registered vendor. Buildings can be treated um, in, in many cases, particularly in the cracks and crevices of the building envelope, which is um, very common, but again, only by licensed individuals. And ideally, you'd want to hire a contractor who's familiar with treating museums, archives, and libraries. We're near the end now. I just want to thank you for joining me in this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them either right now or later. And you can always email me if you have any questions which might come up later. Um, just to remind you, I've uploaded some IPM resources which you may find helpful to have on hand. I've got the Dirty Dozen of Museum Pests, um, which is an illustrated poster, the MLA's IPM guide, the Museum Pest Quick Guide, and the Pest Sighting Log Sheet template. And you've got the uh, Motha Lisa there. I actually um, did not make that. I have also compiled a list of online resources for identifying insects because having a visual aid is very helpful. These sites either have images of pests um, or ways to actually submit a photograph of a pest that you find in your collection to be identified. And there, um, you'll also find links to listservs on these um, on these links. I really can't emphasize enough that museumpest.net um, is, is an amazing website for archives, libraries, and museums to get information about IPM. It's run by the IPM work group and it's completely up to date um, and run by very knowledgeable people. So I really recommend that link in particular. Um, I also want to take a few seconds to introduce you or reintroduce you to our new discussion group and online community. It's a really great place to ask questions, meet and discuss topics with other participants and get more information. I encourage you to register at dhpsny.org backslash forum. Um, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Asian ladybugs. That I will actually have to look into and get back to you. Um, Asian, I haven't actually heard Asian ladybugs um, mentioned before. If you actually want to email me with some, um, some more specifics about where you're finding them and how many there are, I will be happy to look into that for you. And um, my email's up there, gmarcus at dhpsny.org. Thank you, Judith. Um, I have, um, oh, Judith also says that we have found that the electronic plugins work well in deterring mice. And I believe those are the ultrasonic um, plugins, which send out um, sort of, I guess, ultrasonic waves or radio waves to actually deter mice. I've used those um, in places that I've lived, and they are very effective, and they're also um, humane. So that is a very good suggestion. Thank you, Judith. Let's see. Joanne asks, I see centipedes in my area. Are they considered pests in your book? How do you repel or kill them? Um, centipedes actually are very, very common on the East Coast. Um, I do consider them pests. Um, they're actually more interested in, in um, I think, biting people and animals than eating collections. Um, but I can actually look into that too, um, Joanne, and I can email you um, some suggestions for, for getting rid of centipedes. Thank you for that question. Let's see, what else do we have? Uh, Carol asks, can you please put the resources website list back up? Yep, I sure can. Hang on, there we go. That is a good suggestion. Thank you, Carol. Kathleen says, over the past two years, we've experienced an infestation of stink bugs. They seemingly appear out of nowhere in the middle of the floor on windows anywhere. We've been told not to crush them because they stink and release them outside. Any clues to treatment would help. That's also a good question. I will 
look into stink bugs, Kathleen, and I will get back to you on that specifically. Making a note here. Okay. I got stink bugs, Asian ladybugs, and centipedes to look up. Excellent. And we'll get back to all of you on that. Thank you. Um, Ashley asks, are boxeldor, boxeldor beetles bugs a threat? We certainly have many of them. I don't know. Um, that, again, is a very specific beetle, which I will look up and get back to you about. It's, I want to make sure that I'm kind of looking up the right information for each species because pheromone treatment can vary. Um, and I want to make sure that I give you the right information. Thank you for that question. Um, let's see. What to do? Tiana asks, what to do with an individual item that has a tracing of webs and droppings? Um, with that, I would actually probably, I would monitor that in isolation. Um, so if you want to place that in a polyethylene bag with maybe a white backdrop, I'm assuming this is a small object, um, and seal that up and keep that under observation, you can tell if there are pests currently infesting it. Um, of course, you also probably want to clean off those droppings and that, those webs before you stick it in there, but that will allow you to keep a close eye on it to see if the actual object's infested. Um, and you also want to keep an eye on other materials around it, so really make sure that it isn't, you know, spreading to other places. Thank you for that question. Ooh, a bee infestation question from Catherine. Um, Bees are a tricky one, uh, particularly since they're sort of endangered at the moment. That, I would actually contact um, a professional pest control person with that because I think there are very strict regulations and guidelines for bee infestations. Um, and probably a pest specialist in your area would know what those regulations are. Um, in regards to the area you live in. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Elizabeth asks, what is the best treatment for powder post beetles? And with powder post beetles, I would begin by monitoring them, uh, putting sticky traps down. It depends on what kind of infestation we're talking about, if, whether it's the object itself or whether it's the entire um, collection. If you can email me a bit more information, Elizabeth, on um, the extent of the infestation of powder post beetles, that would actually be great. I can look into that um, because there are going to be different treatments depending on the size and, and the actual materials that are infested. Um, Joanne asks, will this webinar be posted along with your audio and links next week? Yes, it absolutely will. Um, so you can hear and see this all again. Does anybody else have any questions? Joanne says, thank you. Thank you for attending, Joanne. I know that pests are not the most um, appealing subject. I did not enjoy some of the photographs I found while, while um, preparing this webinar, but it's really important to, to get involved and keep your collection safe. All right, I think that. Any last questions? Any last past questions? Any questions about the Motha Lisa? All right. Thank you. Carol says thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for coming. All right, thanks, guys. And remember, if you have any questions, please um, email me directly. That's gmarcus at dhpsny.org, and I'll be happy to get back to you. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good day.